so you can see this better. <coughs> well, thank you for the opportunity. Some of you I know, this is a talk, a, a version of a talk I gave at the philosophy department uh, a year and a half ago or so. So if you saw, if you were at that, if it's not that much different, you can feel free to leave. <laughs> but otherwise, I will proceed. Uh, anyway, uh, as, as I indicated in the flyer that went around, when people ask, what do you teach? And I say, philosophy and mathematics, they, all, they say, what? You know, what's the connection? Well, I want to make the case that there's a huge connection between these two fields, historically and even today. So when I saw the, the flyer, uh, Robert had asked me to send, a, send me a picture of myself for the flyer. And when I saw this, I thought, well, let's see. That old guy must be, again, that guy must be Robert. <laughs> anyway, this, is, this is a famous picture called the School of Athens. It was by Raphael. It, it, it's a fresco in the Vatican. And it really nicely brings together, uh, serendipitously, because I didn't send him the picture, but it brings together the, the theme of, of my interest, which is mathematics, philosophy, and the fact that it's in the Vatican. Uh, another interest of mine is, is religion and theology. Uh, given my current appointment as a director of an Interfaith Institute. We'll come back to this image at the end as kind of a summary, because in a way it nicely summarizes what I want to say today. We're going to start actually with Pythagoras, a little before we go, because uh, when I asked the students of 495, what's the most famous theorem, they always say the Pythagorean theorem. And this is a, 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 a statue on the island of Samos where Pythagoras uh, lived and obviously it depicts the right triangle and, and his, uh, his uh, um, theorem, famous theorem. But Bertrand Russell said of Pythagoras that he was intellectually one of the most important men that ever lived because the whole conception of an external world revealed to the intellect but not to the senses is derived from him. So Russell looks back to Pythagoras as the, as the touch point for, for this issue between can we have knowledge that is not necessarily from the senses, but is from, from, from our, our rational being. Plato is famous for having said the knowledge which geometry aims is the knowledge of the eternal and not of the perishing or the transient from his Republic, Book 7. And then that brings us quickly to Euclid, who was a student in Plato's Academy, approximately 300 uh, before the Common Era. And uh, Euclid was, as I indicated, a student there. He went on to establish the School of Mathematics in Alexandria, wrote the Elements, and, the, and is probably most famous for today, especially for the, the axiomatic development of geometry. With five postulates, five common notions, he was able to prove 465 theorems. Now this is going to be old hat to the to the math people here, but uh, this is what I had to tell the philosophers to remind them. He starts with common notions: things equal the same thing or equal to each other, equals added equals or equals, subtracted or equal, things which coincide or equal, and the whole is greater than the part. Nothing really profound, right? Pretty commonsensical kind of notions. Then he added to that the postulates: <coughs> two points determine the straight line. Again, pretty clear. Straight lines <coughs> are extended. A circle can be drawn given any center, point, and radius, and all right angles are equal to each other. So, a fairly efficient set of axioms so far that he was able to develop so much out of these things. <coughs> there was one kicker, of course, and that's the famous fifth postulate, which in Euclid's Elements reads, if, if a straight line falling on two straight lines makes the interior angles on the same side less than two right angles, the two straight lines have produced and definitely meet on that side on which the angles less than are less than two right angles. And, and the character of this postulate right from the very beginning is so different than the common notions and, and the others. It, it, and of course it caused mathematicians for centuries a lot of problems. Why should something that is so rich in, in uh, not in uh, content and is far from intuitively obvious, whereas the other see me, why is that a, a postulate and why can't we prove that? But anyway, that takes us uh, down the story as it, in its relationship to philosophy as well. Of course, that postulate was rewritten in Playfair in the 1700s, and the one that we usually learn now in, in high school geometry. Given a line and a point not on the line, there is one and only one line through the point parallel to the given line. Out of this, as I indicate, uh, Euclid was able to prove 465 theorems, including the sum angles of the triangle equal to right angles, the Pythagorean theorem, congruent and similar triangles, prime numbers are infinite, 
volumes of cones, the cylinders, and spheres. And the, he edits his book 13 with a, a theorem about regular solids, which I want to discuss next. Regular solids uh, are solids or polyhedra where each face is a regular polygon, all the sides are equal and the angles are equal, and each vertex of the polyhedron has the same number of faces and edges. He proved that there are exactly five such regular polyhedra, uh, and they were called the Platonic solids. Now, in the math group, you probably don't need to see the proof, but for the philosophers, I did run through the proof real quickly. We'll start with what the five that were known in the time of Plato and, and Euclid, the tetrahedron, four-sided, the cube or hexahedron, the octahedron, the dodecahedron, and the icosahedron, those 20 sides. Now, <coughs> Plato, they're called Platonic solids because Plato refers to these in his famous dialogue, the Timaeus. And the reason he refers to it is that way back at the time of Plato, there was this desire to combine science with mathematics or to understand the scientific knowledge we have in mathematical terms. And that's still a very driving force in science today. If once you can get it, explain something in mathematical terms, you've explained it. Or as Newton famously said, I don't know what gravity is, but here's, here's how it works. Here's the formula that works. So and that's, been, that's kind of started back in Plato's time. If you can reduce your science to your mathematics, then you've pretty much done the job that you're after. And the science of Plato's day was a, a periodic chart of four elements fire, earth, air, and water. We think that's pretty primitive, but in his day there were people who were arguing that everything is water. And their argument was that, well, we see water in a solid form, ice, we see it in a liquid form, we see it in a gaseous form. So, you know, it covers all the states, so everything must be made out of this water. Uh, <coughs> and, and there was other sort of intuitive reasons. When a fire burns, you see the air escaping from the smoke, you see the, the fire that's there. You see the, the, the crackling, which is the water that is, that is uh, leaving, and then what's left over the ashes are the earth. So, so wood and what it's burned, you see it's been made up of those four elements and you can decompose it. Anyway, Plato said that the fire was actually little atoms of tetrahedra. And earth, because earth, te the tetrahedra, by the way, because they're, they're very pointy, it's a fire breaks things up. The, the, uh, the cube uh, represented earth because it's nice and stable. Air was the octahedron. Water, because it flows and is almost round, uh, was the icosahedron. And of course, that left the dodecahedron, the 12 sided. And he says, well, that's the dome that covers the, the universe. Now, just to take this a little bit further with Plato's Timaeus. And this is a quote from the, from the dialogue. To the earth, then, which is the most stable of the bodies and the most easily modeled of them, may be assigned the form of the cube. And the remaining forms to the other elements, to fire, pyramid, the, to air, the octahedron, to water, the icosahedron, according to their degrees of lightness or heaviness or powers of penetration. The single particles of any of the elements are not seen by reason of their smallness. Well, you got that right. We don't see atoms very well. Uh, they only become visible when collected. The ratios of their motions, numbers, and other properties are ordered by the God who harmonizes them as far as necessity permitted. And there's a fifth figure, which is made out of the 12 pentagons, the dodecahedron. This God used as a model for the 12-fold division of the zodiac. Now, he didn't just lay this out. He also did what we would call today in chemistry, he balanced equations. For example, water, which remember is, is the icosahedron, <laughs> has 20, 20 faces. If you break it up, you get, uh, you get fire, which is the tetrahedron, four faces, plus two airs, which are the, which are the, uh, are the, oct the octahedron. So two times eight plus four is your 20. So you've got the equation balance there. A volume of air divided in two becomes uh, two fire. <laughs> two and a half parts condense of air condensed into one of water. Well, the equation like that, we would like to make those whole numbers, so we would probably say five air, which is 40 faces, equal two waters, which is also 40 faces. So he had a whole concept in his science of, of balancing equations as we do now in chemistry class. The point I want to make is that the science in Plato's day has been replaced many, many times over, and we kind of all smile when we hear uh, about Plato's science. But Euclid's proof, is still valid today. The 
mathematics that was proven during the Greek era is still good mathematics today. Mathematics is the best and most certain description of reality. It's the idea that people have for, for over two millennia. Again, uh, this is for the philosophers, but I'll just quickly run through it. So see, we can just quickly see how Euclid's proof for a quote was, uh, was written. He says, if we're going to look at polyhedra made out of triangles, uh, and we're going to argue there's only five, let's look at what we're dealing with. He starts with, and I'm putting this, of course, in degrees instead of right triangles, but we start with 360 degrees in a circle and 180 degrees in a right triangle. And so in a equilateral triangle, which we're going to build our polyhedra out, each angle would be 60 degrees. The tetrahedron has three vertices on each, I mean three faces on each uh, vertex, and the sum of the angles then would be 180 degrees. He says that's consistent, you know, that works. And the octahedron has four faces on each of the vertices, and the sum of those angles are 240. And the icosahedron has five triangles on each, and you take 5 times 60 degrees, and you see we get 300 degrees, that's still possible. But if we try to make something out of six triangles, the sum of them at the vertex would be 360, and so it would be flat. They could not form a three-dimensional. And then he does the same thing with the cube. Of course, now we're dealing with, with 90 degrees, and the sum of three of, of them at each vertex would be 270. But if we tried to make one out of four squares, it would be 360, and again, our figure would be flat and would not have three dimensions. Then we go on to the dodecahedron, which is made up of pentagons, and each vertex has three pentagons, and the angle of each pentagon, uh, if you don't know offhand, we just break it into three triangles and add those up and divide by five, and we see that each, each angle is going to have 108 degrees. And when we have three of those, we end up with 324 degrees, which is still possible. But if we tried to put four together, it would exceed 360, so it would not be able to be a convex polyhedron. And then we go on and say, what about hexagons? Hexagons can be seen and be thought of as, as equilateral triangles. I mean, you break that up into equilateral triangles, so each of those uh, those angles would be 120, and of course three of those give us one to 360 again. And anything larger than that cannot be a building block for a, poly for a polyhedron because it would, hit, it would have too many, too many degrees at the vertex. Anyway, that's just a real quick run of, of, uh, of Euclid's proof, and that, that concept still holds today. That's still good after 2,000 some years. So, um, we looked at, we, they knew at the time there were five, and the issue for, for, for Euclid was to prove that there can't be any more. His proof is still valid, Plato's like science is not. And the impact that this had on, on mathematics and, and our knowledge in general is this idea that mathematics gives us certain knowledge. It's not knowledge that will change. Once we've proven something, we now enter the realm of what Plato would call the eternal. We have eternal truths that are not uh, subject to, to change. There can be no better description of reality than what mathematics provides. Mathematics was, conceived, was seen as the perfect science. It was seen as a science, and, and at the time, the mathematics was not, as we see it today, a model building, but it was an actual description of reality. It was the queen of the sciences. Now, this continued on to into the Renaissance. Uh, Galileo said the great book of nature can be read only by those who know the language in which it is written, and this language is mathematics. Kepler said the laws of nature are but the mathematical thoughts of God. Kepler, by the way, was still intrigued with these, with these Platonic solids to the point that his first attempt to, to provide the laws for the, for the orbits of the planets around the, around the sun, he attempted to embed, circumscribe uh, around the Platonic solids these spheres, and then oh, around that one, another Platonic solid, and he found that the ratios between them was fairly intriguingly close to what the, the empirical m measurements were, but it didn't work very well. Fortunately, he gave up on it. What's interesting to me is that here, you know, 1,500 years later, more than that, they were still trying to make sense out of the Platonic solids as a principle of explanation for, for science, for what we were discovering. <coughs> uh, 
even as Plato did, Kepler was trying to do it. He did try to put that up and said, it's not circles. Back, you know, the Greeks thought that the circle was the perfect uh, figure, and so the circle must be the way the orbits would go. He gives up the circles and says, let's go for ellipses instead, with a sun at one of the foci, and he gives up constant speed. Another principle of the Greek idea was not only the perfect uh, figures, but also constant speed. And because that, <coughs> because the speed is not constant. If the planets go faster as they get closer to the sun, what is constant is the area that is mapped out in a given time frame. And if you think about this conception, why in the world would area of a two-dimensional ellipse have anything to do with the speed of, of planets going around. I mean, the, the, the conceptual break that he did with his laws, with his laws of or planetary motion is profound when you think of the thousand years plus of Greek ideas of constant speed and, and constant radius, where the circle is the perfect, perfect uh, figure. It's the area that's constant. Descartes goes on as a philosopher. We know him as a mathematician, but the philosophers like to claim him too. And uh, why, what's interesting about the connection here is that for Descartes, mathematics <coughs> was the model for, for the best kind of knowledge. Descartes was living at the time of, of, uh, of Renaissance, Reformation in Europe. Uh, a, lot of this, a lot of things that were believed to be eternally true were kind of falling apart. Uh, he traveled around uh, Europe and elsewhere to try to get him broaden his education. Finally realized that there was really nothing he could, he could put his uh, stakes down for that would be certain, except mathematics. He found mathematics was the model. In his discourse on methods, of which, by the way, the appendix was called La Geometry. Uh, that is the, or Alec Geometry is actually just an appendix to his philosophical work. <laughs> he says it's only the mathematicians who have been able to find some proofs, that is to say, some certain and evident reasons. I was especially delighted with mathematics on the account of their certitude and the evidence of their reasonings. And so when he set forth his four points on method, these are, these are what they are. And as mathematicians, we will recognize them. Not to accept anything as true, which did not clearly known to be true. You know, there's, there's uh, Euclid's basic common notions and, and postulates. Divide each difficulty into as many parts as possible. In an orderly way, begin with the simplest objects. Gradually climb right up to the knowledge of the most complex. And for make my calculations throughout so complete and my review so general that I would be confident of not omitting everything. A good set of guidelines for math students. <coughs> Uh, <clears throat> those long chains of reasoning, all simple and easy, which geometries have habitually used to reach their most difficult proofs, gave me occasion to imagine to myself that everything which could fall under human knowledge would follow in the same way. <laughs> so Descartes, <laughs> as, 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 the, as his, his method for philosophy. Even Hume, the great skeptic, who questioned everything, including causality and everything else, said, though there, are, there never were a circle or a triangle in nature, at least understood that these were abstract things that we never can see a circle because it's you know, two-dimensional. Anyway, uh, the truths demonstrated by Euclid would forever retain their certainty and evidence. So even a great skeptic like Hume sees mathematics as that certain truth. A famous mathematician Kant said, all properly mathematical judgments are synthetic a priori. For that, if you can do a little review of your, of your introduction to philosophy, he divided things which were analytic and <coughs> synthetic. And analytic were things like mathematical statements or all, all bachelors are married, things that are true by the, by the very nature of the words. Synthetic are things that are true about nature. They're not, they're not true just because of the way the words, the meanings of the words. And a priori, those things that we know before we've experimented, a posteriori are things that we learn from experience. And Kant famously said that mathematics is synthetic. It's not true just because of the meaning of the words, because you know there's nothing in the in, in all triangles have 180 degrees. There's nothing in the meaning of those words that would make it true. It is something that's true apart from the meaning, and yet it is not. And yet it is not something that we find through through measurement and evidence. We don't go out and measure triangles and then 
and have come to that conclusion. So his, his whole idea on the mathematics is synthetic and a priori, and that was an important part of his philosophy. In every specific natural science, there can only be found so much science proper as there is mathematics presented in it. Now, some of this is still true in science today. You know, people still, when you've got it down in the mathematics, you've, you've pretty well got it done. The science of mathematics presents the most brilliant example of the extension of the sphere of pure reason without the aid of experience. And it's this debate through the history of philosophy between does our knowledge all come through the senses, the empirical senses, what we can measure and experiment on, or is there knowledge that comes through reason that is not dependent upon the senses? And this is the, you can describe the whole history of philosophy as a debate between these, these two. And mathematics plays that pivotal role always in the middle of that debate. Is mathematics empirical? You say no, it's logical. And does that mean, therefore, is that an argument in case of the rationalists? And the rationalists would argue, of course, as did Kant and Descartes and many others. And the empiricists would say, well, you know, there's other ways of looking at it. They have to account for mathematics, which is sometimes a tough job. How does mathematics function if it is, if everything has to be empirical? Anyway, um, well, I'll come back to the summary a little bit later, but it's, it's really clear here in Kant and some of these others during this time period. Of course, the thing that really changed the whole world happened after Kant and Descartes and uh, the early scientists, and that is the development of non-Euclidean geometry. Uh, going back to the five postulates of Euclid, we see that that fifth postulate on the parallel given a line and a point, not on the line, there's one and only one line through the point parallel to given line. That was the one that had been questioned and there been many, many attempts throughout history to explain or to prove that based on the other on the other uh, axioms. Or to take other axioms and and prove this. For example, if you start with if one of your axioms is that all right all triangles angles add up to two right angles. If you use that as, a, as an axiom, you can prove the parallel washington. So there were lots of alternatives to the parallel washington, but nobody could, could, could get by with just using the four postulates to prove this. But anyway, so that was that then became a, a question, and I won't go into all of the historical details as to how that came about with the work of Sacco and others. But the big, the big three for, for, the, for the first non-Euclidean geometry were Gauss in Germany, Volia in Hungary and Lobachevsky in Russia, all working about the same time. Uh, John Volia's <laughs> father, Wolfgang, said, For God's sake, please give up. Fear it no less than sensual passion, because it too may take up all your time and deprive you of your health, peace of mind, and happiness of life. Uh, another little historical uh, footnote here is that Wolfgang Volia sent to Gauss his son's work. And, uh, and Gauss said, I, I would like to praise it, but if I did, I'd only be praising myself, because I had actually worked that out years ago. <laughs> 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 anyway, uh, then Riemann uh, came up with the alternative. If, 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 there's, if you assume there's more than one parallel line, uh, and you can get a consistent geometry, what if you assume there are no parallel lines? And of course, as you all know, in the, the Lobachevskian or, or Boya, non-Euclidean geometry triangles have less than 180 degrees, and in Riemannian geometry, which is modeled by the sphere, uh, triangles have more than 180 degrees. Now, Morris Klein, in his Mathematics and Western Culture, in his uh, big, huge history book, says, the importance of non-Euclidean geometry in the general history of thought cannot be exaggerated. Like Copernicus heliocentric theory, Newton's law of gravitation, and Darwin's theory of evolution, non-Euclidean geometry has radically affected science, philosophy, and religion. It is fair to say that no more cataclysmic event has ever taken place in the history of all thought. Well, in the math community, we know that non-Euclidean geometry was a, a very creative point at which a whole lot of new kinds of mathematics was, was developed. And we celebrate that. But Klein is arguing that it was a, such a shock, not it was to mathematics. There were famous mathematicians that refused to even consider the non Euclidean geometry. But he's saying that it also affected science and philosophy and religion. And the big thing here is why did it have that huge <coughs> effect? Because for 2,000 years there was this concept of eternal truth. And if you 
question whether there's a challenge to us, just go check with your local mathematician and he'll explain it to you. <laughs> Here's the eternal truth, and, uh, and now that's clear, okay, now let's go on. Uh, so so when, when you have more than one geometry, and you no longer can claim that Euclidean geometry is the actual description of reality, not, not just a consistent system or a model, but it is the actual description of reality, if you can no longer claim that, then what can you claim? Where is absolute truth? Where, what, what do we do with this geometry is the knowledge of the eternal? What happens to that? And the influence of that over 2,000 years was profound. And Klein recognizes that. It led to a rethinking of mathematics. The non-Euclidean geometry took place during the 19th century. And at the end of the 19th century were the great foundations of mathematics debates. And that's a whole lecture in itself, so I won't go through the details except just to highlight who some of the major thinkers were. Logicism was developed by Bertrand Russell, intuitionism by Brouwer, and formalism by David Hilbert. Um, if you want to talk about those, we can, but like I said, that's a whole other lecture. But I want to jump now to Bertrand Russell because my talk is from Plato to Russell, and in particular, I've, I've, the subtitle I said that this is the 100th anniversary of the publication of the second volume of his famous Principia Mathematica. When I did this for the philosophy department, it's the 100th anniversary of the volume one. <laughs> so the timings have been fine here. Anyway, Bertrand Russell, uh, I want to tell his story, but I'm going to shift gears a little bit and move into a comic book form. It's nice to get a little change of pace. And if you're not familiar with this book called Logic it's Comics, it's a, it's, a, it's a really fun book that tells the whole story of Russell and Whitehead and the whole development and some of the problems that developed that. I'll give you a, a little excerpt from that in comic form. Here's uh, Bertie Russell's first wife saying, oh, Master Bertie is also displeased with philosophy. At least mathematicians try not to contradict one another. Not so philosophers. They are all great and all in total disagreement. <laughs> they call this trash philosophy. I want to find my way to reality, man. I want a method to acquire certain knowledge. See that goal? That that was there from Plato, Euclid, and it's still with Bertrand Russell. He wants a certain knowledge. If we unite the healthy parts of mathematics and the conceptual sophistication of the new logic, we can launch a powerful attack. He really wanted to build a foundation not only for mathematics, but for philosophy, for knowledge in general. Well, he's sitting in on, on uh, Alfred North Whitehead's class, and Whitehead says, to achieve any kind of certainty in mathematics, we must re-examine its basic assumptions. We must begin at the beginning. And Bertie sits back there, here, here. So he meets with Whitehead and says, sure, it's come a certain way since Aristotle, but is it strong enough to deal with mathematics? And Whitehead says, let's join forces. And Whitehead was famous for his book on universal algebra. And so Russell says, you mean write a second volume of universal algebra? He says, no, write together a brand new book. So they work on what becomes Principia Mathematica, which is kind of an interesting bit of, uh, of, of uh, Overconfidence, maybe. Principia Mathematica was what the great Newtonian uh, book was, and they decided to call theirs the same thing. And he gets like Russell gets excited. Whitehead, I've got it this time. I've finally done with the damn thing. And he says, "Real? You're done? What is it? It's proven. One plus one equals two. <laughs> <laughs> On page three hundred and sixty-two, it says, and therefore." One plus one equals two. And the kid says, I don't get it. Why 362 pages? Let me play old chap. So <laughs> it, was, it was such an enormous rethinking of logic and symbolic logic and the whole basis that it, it took that long for him, for him to prove that one plus one equals two. Russell then starts, uh, as things develop, he starts losing confidence in his, his own program and says, to understand my predicament, remember that my profound underlying aim, aim had never changed, to acquire certain knowledge about the world. Same idea. Somehow mathematics should tell, give us information about the world. Knowledge which should only come from science. But science depended upon mathematics, which was a total mess, plagued by unproved assumptions and circular definitions. To repair it, a powerful logic was needed, but there wasn't one. 
and so it came to an impasse. He finally said, mathematics is a subject where we don't know what we're talking about, or whether what we're saying is true. And this was actually an insight that is important for all of mathematics, because we, Euclid tried, one of the problems with Euclid's elements is that he tries to define everything. And he defines a point as location without extension. That helps. A line is breadth, is length without breadth. And as, uh, as we often point out to our students, if you try to define everything, you get into a circular reason. One example I like, I think it's Oxford Dictionary, that defines a dog as a, as a, quadruped, a quadruped of the genus Cana. <laughs> you, know, it's, you, you end up using more complicated words to describe simple words, and even if you have simpler words, if you look up the meaning of those, you'll eventually, it'll eventually cycle around. So, so definitions aren't necessarily circular. And, and Russell recognized that. He also recognized that our axioms are not always intuitively true. They are beginning points. So we can't prove the axioms, and we can't ultimately define. So we don't know what we're talking about, and know whether what we're saying is true. In his Portraits from Memory, his autobiography, he says, I wanted certainty, again, this key certainty, in the kind of way in which people want religious faith. I thought that certainty is more likely to be found in mathematics than elsewhere. After some 20 years of arduous toil, I came to the conclusion that there was nothing more that I could do in the way of making mathematical knowledge indubitable. The splendid certainty which I had always hoped for in mathematics was lost in a bewildering maze. So, 100 years ago, they published their three-volume Principia Mathematica. Uh, he died in 98, in 1970, uh, 40 years ago now, approximately. Uh, but the question of mathematics in reality, and the search that, you, that uh, Russell, along with Euclid, Descartes, and many others, is still a question that we often ponder. Does mathematics describe reality? Is mathematics just a game, as some of the formulas were? Is mathematics meaningless? Are mathematical objects real? Are numbers real? Are points and lines real? Reality is one of the issues philosophers deal with. It's called ontology. Ontology is what is real, what is true. And so these are, these are questions that a philosopher would, would want to pose to the mathematician. And if mathematics is not real, is <laughs> I mean, we have this much certainty about mathematics, and everything else is less certain, and mathematics isn't real. You know, what's going on here? Questions of, is mathematics discovered or invented? Question of certainty in mathematics. Realism. The status of logicism, of formalism, of intuition. These are kind of the questions we deal with in, in the philosophy of mathematics. And then finally, the question of structural realism. In the last 20 years or so, there's been a new movement in the philosophy of mathematics called structural realism. And that's another whole talk, which I don't have time to do today, but, uh, but it's one that I have presented at some, at some international meetings. And it's a, a very intriguing way of, of making sense out of this whole question of whether mathematics is real. And it really comes back to the, quite, to the picture that uh, Robert picked for the notice. And this, this is, like I said, from Raphael's famous uh, The School of Athens. And it's a good way to summarize uh, the, the part of the story I want to say. The person on the left is supposed to be Plato, and notice that he is pointing upward. He is pointing to the rational truth, to the certainty that transcends our experience. And Aristotle is saying, no, it's here on Earth. It's empiricism. It's what we can see. It's what we can touch. It's what we can feel. It's what we can hear. It's what we can measure. It's, it comes from the sciences. And Plato says, no, there is knowledge that comes from outside. It comes through our reason. And so this is a summary, in, in a way, of what of what the role of mathematics has been in the history of philosophy is this tension between can there be knowledge that is not empirical? Is there, is there knowledge, even better knowledge, that comes through our reasoning and through our rationality that is not subject to empiricism and to what our senses tell us? But uh, since I have a little bit of time, uh, I guess I want to race through this pretty fast, realizing I was under time constraint. I'm going to take the opportunity to do a personal postscript. Um, and it's, I want to talk about three famous philosophers, Wittgenstein, Russell, 
and Carl Hoffer. And <coughs> Russell, of course, we've talked about, became not only a famous mathematician, but a famous philosopher. Karl Popper was one of the famous philosophers of science. And Wittgenstein was the philosopher who, in many ways, caused the revolution towards analytic philosophy, and then a whole new way of looking at philosophy uh, in his philosophical investigations. Probably, most people would argue, is perhaps the most influential philosopher of the 20th century. A lot of interesting stories about Wittgenstein, too. But the story I want to tell is when Popper was invited to the Cambridge University Moral Sciences Club. This is the club that, that the, the greats had belonged to Russell Whitehead, uh, Lots of Wittgenstein. These were, this was the, the sort of the elite club in Cambridge, and you had to be nominated to be and approved to be a member of the club. In October 1946, Karl Popper was invited for the first time. He was not a member, but he was invited as an outside lecturer to give a talk on your philosophical problems. Wittgenstein was famous for saying there really aren't any philosophical problems. It's just problems of language. We confuse ourselves with the way in which we talk about things. We talk about, I have keys in my pocket, therefore I have ideas in my head. In, in this, Because the grammar is similar, we think that ideas are things like, are things like keys. And if they're in your mind, then it's like keys in your pocket. And he says you know, his, his approach in analytic philosophy was to analyze things from a, gra from a grammar and understand uh, why they weren't really philosophical problems. And so <clears throat> Popper, on the other hand, as a philosopher of science, was committed to the idea that science does, in fact, describe reality, and there's a methodology for it. Falsification was the key term that Popper used. And he wanted to argue that there are philosophical problems. This, the whole, this whole story uh, is recorded in a book that was published uh, about 10 years ago called Wittgenstein's Poker. Because the seminar took place in, in Brathwaite, another famous, another famous uh, philosopher, in his library in Cambridge, if you've ever been there, the, the faculty, uh, it, it's, if you're, once you make professor, it's pretty nice. You have an office, you have your own adjoining library with a fireplace keep warm. And uh, so the, the, the seminar was actually taking place in Brathwaite's library. And, <coughs> and at one point in the debate, in the discussion after Popper made his claim, Wittgenstein got very, very agitated and argued against Popper and said, finally, and to make his point, he grabbed the poker from the fireplace and was waving it, according to the... <laughs> <laughs> By the way, this story is really fascinating because there, there's the, uh, eight different versions of what happened, depending on if you're a pro-Popperian or a pro wittgenstein as to who did what and, and what was exactly said, but they turn out, you know, unpack the whole thing. And finally, Wittgenstein says, give me an example of a moral truth. And Popper said, one shouldn't threaten a guest speaker with a poker. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so anyway, this, this was what happened. Now, in Brathwaite's library, there was a set of the Principia Mathematica, the three volumes, and I happen to have three volumes of the Principia Mathematica. If you want to come up and take a look at it afterwards, I have even put a little sticky on page 362 where it says, from this proposition it will follow when arithmetical addition has been defined that 1 plus 1 equals 2. <laughs> but the other interesting part of this is that if you look on the front page, this was R.B. Brathwaite's personal copy of the Principia Mathematica. And when I left the dean's office in 2004, was it? Uh, the faculty, some of you were still here, collected some funds and bought me a bunch of philosophy books because I was moving into my faculty role. And one of the treasured things were the three volumes of, of Principia Mathematica. There aren't very many original editions of this around, I don't think, anymore. And to not only have one, thanks to, to my faculty colleagues back then, but to have Brathwaite's when it was, when it was uh, part of the story of Wittgenstein's poker is kind of a special little uh, personal thing for me. And, uh, <coughs> and um, so anyway, it, for me, that kind of pulls together my own personal history as well as my exploration over the decades in philosophy and mathematics and how these things fit together. So I think with that, we're done. <laughs> Any questions? Is that all you ever do?
Any questions for our speaker? Yes. <coughs> I'm just trying to think. It seems to us in this present day that the last state of mathematics are further apart. Is that because of the strength of silence uh, becoming stronger than in along those th lines of the last 25, 30 years? Well, I mean, certainly, certainly the, the success of science has had a big impact. But I would argue that it's, it's, that's, that's sort of a positive force on, on, uh, on, uh, on, on why we see, tend to see things scientifically rather than mathematically. But I would argue that the other, the other part of it is, is the, the shift in the understanding of mathematics is no longer a science. It is not a description of the empirical reality. It is something else. And whether it's a game or whether it's meaningless or whether it's, uh, you know, what, what it is, you know, we still don't have a good handle on it. But, it, but we, no one, very few people would argue that it is a description of empirical reality. It may be a description of another part of reality. If one, if one, one argues that there is more to the universe than matter, and if science is primarily looking at matter, but there are other things like structure, and structural philosophy tend to do that, or like relationships, uh, then patterns, and all these things are things that mathematicians also like to talk about. If you say that, there, that reality includes those kind of things, not just material things, then, then you know, there, there may be a place for that. But it doesn't have the same role that it had. And it, I, think, I think that uh, with the case I would like to make is that, that really the turning point of that began as, as uh, Morris Klein suggested with the development of the geometry. That's when the, the sort of uh, the stranglehold on, on reality in mathematics is. is so there's a real push and have been for quite a while that in the teaching of say K-12 mathematics that it's real life. That I mean, do you see that as part of the issue as well? And it's real life? Yeah, that, that, you know, the question often becomes is as you're teaching this uh, particular lesson, how does it relate to real life? Well, that's a, me. I mean, I, 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 got, I might want to think about it a little bit more, but my first reaction would be that's a pedagogical question. Mm -hmm. And I think pedagogically, of course we want to teach things that are relevant to real life. And so is mathematics relevant? Absolutely. In fact, if science is more dependent upon mathematics now than it's ever been. And, and so is, is, does mathematics inherit its reality via science? Mm -hmm. You know, maybe. That's one way you could argue the case. Or <coughs> is, is, math, is science reach a dead end when it puts things in mathematical terms and it finally says, we well, can't go any further because I have now put it in terms that are no longer empirical, that are rational. And that's as far as we can go. We, we, science does not proceed, uses reason, of course, but it doesn't proceed with an axiomatic base that is apart from empiricism. And as I find it really interesting that, that people like Dawkins and others say that there is no reality other than what the scientists can discover. And yet the scientists use mathematics all the time. <laughs> and they have discovered that through their empirical method, which is supposed to be the, the summa bonum of, of all of all uh, knowledge. Uh, you know, when they finally get to mathematics, and that's as far as they can go, and they think they're done. They think, hey, we've got it, we've got our name. So anyway, your question is interesting, but I, I would tend to think of it more in pedagogical terms. Mm -hmm. That we we want our students to, to relate to these things in, in real life terms, and I try to do it in college classes too. So I think that makes sense. Do I have time for my foundations lecture? <laughs> <laughs> There's no more questions. Let's thank uh, Professor Kinji again. The creators in the print copy are uh, both of that kind of comments. Uh,